Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Executive Vice President Valdis uh, Dombrovsky. Since our last Governing Council meeting in late January, the spread of the coronavirus, COVID-19, has been a major shock to the growth prospects of the global economy and the euro area economy, and it has heightened market volatility. Even if ultimately temporary by nature, it will have a significant impact on economic activity. In particular, it will slow down production as a result of disrupted supply chains and reduce domestic and foreign demand especially through the adverse impact of the necessary containment measures. In addition, the heightened uncertainty negatively affects expenditure plan and their financing. Governments and all other policy institutions are called upon to take timely and targeted actions to address the public health challenge of containing the spread of the coronavirus and mitigate the economic impact. In particular, an ambitious and coordinated fiscal policy response, ambitious and coordinated fiscal policy response is required to support businesses and workers at risk. The Governing Council strongly supports the commitment of Euro area governments and the European institutions to joint and coordinated policy action in response to the repercussions of the spread of the coronavirus. We also welcome the decisions taken by the ECB's Supervisory Board, which are detailed in a separate press release which I'm sure you have seen and was published earlier today. In line with our mandate, the Governing Council is determined to support households and firms in the face of the current economic disruption and heightened uncertainty. Accordingly, we decided on a comprehensive package of monetary policy measures Together with the substantial monetary policy stimulus already in place, these measures will support liquidity and funding conditions for households, businesses and banks, and will help to preserve the smooth provision of credit to the real economy. Let me start with the first. We decided to conduct temporarily additional longer-term refinancing operations, also known by you as LTROs, in order to provide immediate liquidity support to the euro area financial system. Although we do not see material signs of strains in money markets or liquidity shortages in the banking system, these operations will provide an effective backstop in case of need. They will be carried out through a fixed rate tender procedure with full allotment with an interest rate that is equal to the average rate on the deposit facility, the DFR. The LTRO will provide liquidity at favorable terms to bridge the period until the TLTRO3 operation in June 2020. And I come to the second instrument. The Governing Council decided to apply considerably more favorable terms during the period from June 20th to June 21 to all TLTROs operations outstanding during that same time. These operations will support bank lending to those affected most by the spread of the coronavirus. In particular, 
small and medium-sized enterprises. Throughout that period, the interest rates on these TLTRO3 operations will be 25 basis points below the average rate applied in the Eurosystem's main refinancing operation, also known as the MRO. So MRO minus 25 basis points. For those counterparties that maintain their levels of credit provision, the rate applied in these operations will be lower. And over the period ending in June 2021, can be as low as 25 basis points below the average interest rate on the deposit facility. So 50 basis points plus 25 equal minus 75 basis points as an interest rate for those uh, channels that actually maintain their exposure. Moreover, the maximum total amount that counterparties will henceforth be entitled to borrow in TLTRO3 operations is raised to 50% of their stock of eligible loans as at February 28, 2019. In this context, the Governing Council will mandate the Eurosystem committees to investigate collateral easing measures to ensure that counterparties continue to be able to make full use of our funding support. I come now to the third element of our package. We decided to add a temporary envelope of additional net asset purchases of 100 billion euros until the end of this year, ensuring a strong contribution from the private sector purchase program. That envelope, in combination with the existing asset purchase program, this will support favorable financing conditions for the real economy in times of heightened uncertainty. We continue to expect net asset purchases to run for as long as necessary to reinforce the accommodative impact of our policy rates and to end shortly before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. In addition, the Governing Council decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We expect them to remain at their present or lower levels until we have seen the inflation outlook robustly converge to levels sufficiently close to, but below 2% within our projection horizon, and such convergence has been consistently reflected in underlying inflation dynamics. We also intend to continue, to, to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of accommodation. You will have further details on the precise terms of these new operations that I have just described. They will be published in a dedicated press release that will be available this afternoon at 3.30. In view of the current developments, the Governing Council will continue to monitor closely the implications of the spread of the coronavirus for the economy, for medium-term inflation, and for the transmission of its monetary policy. The Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments, as appropriate, to ensure that inflation moves towards its aim in a sustained manner, in line with its commitment to symmetry. Let me now quickly explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. The latest indicators suggest a considerable worsening of the near-term growth outlook. The disruption of supply chains is impeding production plans in the manufacturing sector, while necessary containment measures against the further spread of the coronavirus are adversely affecting economic activity. Before the coronavirus outbreak, 
Euro area real GDP growth moderated to 0.1% quarter on quarter in the fourth quarter of 2019, following growth of 0.3% in the third quarter of 2019. This mainly reflected the ongoing weaknesses in the euro area manufacturing sector and slowing investment growth. Looking beyond the disruption stemming from the coronavirus, euro area growth is expected to regain traction over the medium term, supported by favorable financing conditions, the euro area fiscal stance and the expected resumption in global activity. Now, this assessment that I've just shared with you is only partly reflected in the March 2020 ECB staff macroeconomic projection for the euro area, as the data cutoff date predates the most recent rapid spread of the coronavirus to the euro area. These projections, which are by necessity partly outdated, as you understand it, foresee annual real GDP increasing by 0.8% in 2020, 1.3% in 2021 and 1.4% in 2022. In particular, the projections foresee very muted growth in the first half of 2020, followed by an improvement in the second half of the year. Compared with the December 2019 Euro system staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for real GDP growth has been revised down, notably for 2020 and slightly for 2021 on account of the potential economic impact of the coronavirus outbreak. These numbers actually are very similar to those published by the OECD recently. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook are clearly on the downside. In addition to the previously identified risks related to geopolitical factors, rising protectionism and vulnerabilities in emerging markets, the spread of the coronavirus adds a new and substantial source of downside risk to the global growth. According to Eurostat flash estimate, Euro area annual HICP inflation decreased to 1.2% in February 2020 from 1.4% in January 2020. On the basis of the sharp decline in current and futures prices for oil, headline inflation is likely to decline considerably over the coming month. Indicators of inflation expectations have fallen and measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted. While labor cost pressures have so far remained resilient amid tighter labor markets, the weaker growth momentum is delaying their pass through to inflation. Over the medium term, the increase in inflation will be supported by our monetary policy measures and the recovery in the euro area growth dynamics. This assessment is only partly reflected in the March 2020 ECB staff macroeconomic projection for the euro area, which foresees annual HICP inflation at 1.1 in 2020, 1.4 in 2021, and 1.6 in 2022. Compared with the December 2019 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for HICP inflation is broadly unrevised over the projection horizon. The implications of the coronavirus for inflation are surrounded by high uncertainty, given that downward pressures linked to weaker demand may be offset by upward pressures related to supply disruption. The recent sharp decline in oil prices poses significant downside risks to the short-term inflation outlook. Turning now to the monetary analysis. Broad money growth, M3, stood at 5.2% in January, having moderated somewhat from its recent peak. Money growth continues to reflect ongoing bank credit creation for the private sector and low opportunity costs of holding M3 relative to other financial instruments. The narrow monetary aggregate, M1, continues to be the main contributor to broad money growth. Loans to the private sector continued to expand. The annual growth rate of loans to household picked up somewhat to 3.7% in January 2020 from 3.6% in December 2019. 
the annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations remained unchanged at 3.2% in January, confirming the moderation seen since autumn 2019 and likely reflecting the typically lagged reaction to the past weakening in the economy. Overall, our accommodative monetary policy stance, including the measures taken today that I have just described for you, will safeguard favorable bank lending conditions and will continue to support access to financing, including for those affected most by the ramifications of the coronavirus, and in particular, for small and medium-sized enterprises. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is necessary for the robust convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Regarding fiscal policy policies that I have already addressed very early on in this communication, an ambitious and coordinated fiscal stance is now needed in view of the weakened outlook and to safeguard against the further materialization of downside risks. We certainly welcome the measures already taken by several governments to ensure sufficient health sector resources and to provide support to affected companies and employees. In particular, measures such as providing credit guarantees are needed to complement and reinforce the monetary policy measures that I have announced today. We welcome the commitment of the euro area governments and the European institutions to act now, strongly, and together in response to the repercussions of the further spread of the coronavirus. Before I take your questions, together with the Vice President, we would like, on behalf of the Governing Council, to express our profound gratitude to all those who are dedicating their time and their efforts in saving life and containing the spread of the coronavirus. With that, and also let me just announce... Oh dear, I made a mistake. The APP's envelope that we're putting together as part of our increased uh, special effort is 120 billion euros, not 100. That's 120 billion euros as an envelope specifically intended to address the current situation that comes on top of our previous APPs. And that will be available until the end of the year. Let me now just announce a slightly different setup, as you can see. So we'll be, we'll be taking questions in the room, and I'll also be reading out questions from your colleagues who are um, sending in their questions remotely and reading them out. So bear, bear with me also with trying out this for the first time today. But I'll start with, in the room with Mr. Skolimowski. Uh, Madame Lagarde, my first question would be about uh, the rationale for not cutting interest rates today. Could you give us w the reason why um, there was no rate cut today? Is it because there was not enough support for such a move within the Governing Council? Or maybe um, you all considered this is counterproductive? That's my first question. Another question is about the issue you mentioned as the last, which is this extra envelope of uh, QE. Um, have you also discussed as part of adding that envelope um, change to your issue and issuer limits uh, of the current program? And also, um, will the decisions change anything with regards to the orientation of the APP towards meeting the capital key? Um, thank you. Well, thank you for your questions. Uh, I would first of all like to indicate to you that we very much operated in the same setting at the Governing Council of the ECB. In other words, some members were in the room, other members were online and participated fully uh, to the discussions. We, uh, we innovated, we, uh, we had a good outcome, so much so that we actually had a unanimous decision on the various elements of the package that I have announced to you earlier on. So, 
this unanimous uh, decision that was um, reached uh, today was clearly um, determined by the fact that we believe that we have the most efficient, best targeted, and most focused set of tools to address the kind of risks that we are facing under the current circumstances. So if we are to compare one instrument versus the other, we certainly considered altogether that the use of this additional 120 billion uh, asset purchase program on the top of pre-existing programs was the most efficient response to the market uh, excess sensitivities that we see at the moment. That's question one. Your second question uh, had to do with how we are, organi how we are going to organize uh, this asset purchase programs. And I can assure you on that page that first of all, we will make use of all the flexibilities that are embedded in the uh, framework of the asset purchase program. And that second, at the end of the asset purchase program, we will converge towards the capital keys. Mr. Sims. Thank you. Um, a question okay. on the economy with the uh, risks pointed clearly to the downside. Can the Eurozone avoid a recession this year? And um, what will happen with the uh, strategy review? Will it be postponed or put on hold um, given that you can't um, even hold public hearings? You know, I think it is clear to all of us uh, that the economies of the world and certainly the economies of the euro area are facing a ma major shock. I think the response to your question will clearly depend on the speed, the strength, and the collective approach that will be taken by all players. And as I have said at the very beginning of this uh, introductory statement, First and foremost, and on the front line in our analysis of the situation, are the fiscal authorities and the European institutions that harness uh, fiscal uh, authorities and advise in that relation. So that is the reason why we are strongly encouraging and hoping for that ambitious and coordinated fiscal response that I have mentioned. Second, uh, the strategy review is clearly deferred for the moment, and we have in particular decided to postpone by a matter of six months the first next big meeting that we had uh, in, in our deliberation. So instead of focusing on April the 1st, we are now looking at the end of May, and we will determine based on the development and so of circumstances and the success in containing and delaying the spreading of this virus, how and when and at what speed and under what circumstances and using what tools we will be able to have our deliberations within the governing council, but more importantly, our reach out effort in order to include academia, academics, um, non-governmental organizations, members of parliaments and representatives of civil society at large, because clearly the, uh, the facilities that we had and the, our determination to reach out is, is uh, impaired by the circumstances under which many of our euro area governments are now uh, handling uh, the risk situation that they're facing. Thank you. Mr. Arnold. Martin Arnold, Financial Times. Uh, I'd like to hear your response to the travel restrictions announced by President Donald Trump. Uh, yesterday evening in particular as regards what, what impact that could have on the global economy uh, and whether you think the responses of, of various governments to the virus uh, outbreak and the spread of the virus could plunge the global economy into recession this year. Uh, and uh, secondly, just to go back to a point that was already raised at, um, on issuer limits, do you need to raise the self-imposed issuer limits uh, on the QE programme? Thanks. Martin, our mandate is price stability. And 
clearly in the face of the current circumstances, we have to use all the tools that we have available in order to almost surgically uh, support and contribute our part to this collective approach that is badly needed. I'm not going to comment on decisions that are made by um, a government outside the euro area. Our job in that respect is to analyze the economic consequences that will result uh, from those decisions and to assess which segment of the economy uh, will need support and, uh, and will benefit from the tools that we are deploying at the moment. In terms of issue limits, I've already uh, discussed that matter uh, during the previous uh, question. And, um, you know, it is clear that we will use in the work that we do in the coming weeks and months all the flexibility that is embedded in the framework of the asset purchase program. And uh, if you look carefully at the introductory statement, we do put uh, some emphasis on the private uh, sector bonds, because we believe that that is where there is currently um, acute sensitivity. And clearly, we will have, in due course, and depending on developments on all the markets where we operate, we will have to target and use the flexibility that is needed in order to respond to the excess sensitivities that we see. Ms. Laird? Wait, wait, wait until you have the mic. Oh, thank you. Uh, two questions, if you, if you will. First, is this your do-whatever-it-takes moment, and did you expect to have one so quickly? The second point is, by not cutting rates today, it makes the ECB look a little out of step with the Fed and the, uh, and the Bank of England. Does that raise concerns about currency, uh, subconscious or unintended currency devaluations, competitive devaluations? Is the, the euro rallied a tiny bit after today's decision? You know, we do not determine our monetary policy stance on the basis of uh, currency variations. We are attentive to it, but this is not a determining factor. And the euro depreciates, appreciates, re depreciates. I think it's the key issue is currently to face uh, the fundamentals of the economy and to make sure that the liquidity risk doesn't materialize, that the credit continues to flow to the economy, and that to address the uh, market excess uh, sensitivities in order to uh, restore uh, some, uh, some stability. That, that's what we are concerned about. And I remember saying when uh, my predecessor and friend, um, President Draghi, left and when I had interviews before the European Parliament that I, I would hope that I would never have to do whatever it takes. What is good about our today's deliberation, deliberations is that there was rallying support around the table to use all the tools available and to consider adjusting our instruments going forward in order to target those risks that we see as threats to stability in the euro area. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a claim to history for being whatever it takes, number two. I, I really would like all of us to join forces, and I, I very much hope that the fiscal authorities will appreciate that we will only deal with this shock if we come together. I'm just going to take a question from Mark Schroes, which is in line with what you just had. Uh, Two questions he has. With the additional net asset purchases, limits such as the issuer limit might become a problem quickly or more quickly, for example, in the case of Germany. Do the decisions on the APP change anything about the fact that the ECB capital key is the central orientation for the purchases under the PSPP program? That's his first question. And the second one is, does the decision not to reduce the deposit rate also have to do with the changed assessment that the rate is already closer to the so-called reversal rate than previously assumed? Oh, that's, on the latter one, it's very simple. We are certainly not at the reversal rate. I mean, if we were at the reversal rate, we would not see the growth of credit as, as I have described for you, both to the households uh, sector and to the, uh, to the enterprises sector. So no, we are not at the uh, reversal rate, and we are certainly not at the lower um, lower band rate. Um, and, and if in the future it is necessary 
for the purpose of dealing with the risks at the time to address that through the, uh, uh, the DFR, we will do so. Um, on the other point, I think I've dealt extensively with these issue limits. And uh, all I have to say at this moment, again, is that we will use all flexibilities embedded in the framework of our uh, asset purchase program. And, uh, and bear in mind, by the way, to this nice person who is on, on the line and that I, I uh, salute while not seeing him, bear in mind that we are likely to see increased debt issuance uh, on the part of uh, a few countries, if only to deal with the fiscal resources that they will have to mobilize in order to put in place the health care system that will be needed to respond to the, uh, the spreading of the disease. That's also a factor to have in mind. Ms. Weisbach? It's coming. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Um, let me ask you a question about the timing of your decisions. When did you realize that this situation is getting out of control and you need to uh, come up with like a bold package and why didn't you act like the Fed directly after the, this first G7 call? Um, and another question would be where do you think could the funds come from? Is the ESM, for example, a good source to deploy funds also on a Eurozone level? You know, on the, on, on the Eurozone level, uh, and it, at the European level at large, but I'm more concerned about the Euro area, of course, in, in my position. I think all governments have to um, uh, be on deck and ready to act. I also think that all European institutions have to uh, join forces and rally around this collective package that needs to be um, put in place. We are in very, very frequent um, uh, dialogue with the European Investment Bank, for instance, with the European Commission, clearly, uh, with the European Stability Mechanisms. I, I have not had uh, very recent discussions, but it's clearly one of the players on the European scene. And I think that you know all players have to play their part in due course and to join hands. I think it's a collective effort that needs to be to be developed here. Mr. Heitman. Uh, Luke Heitman, Market News. President Lagarde, the market reaction to today's announce announcement seems to be pretty negative, um, and some have suggested the package compares poorly with the BOE. What would you say to them? That's my first question. And secondly, you said today's decision was unanimous, but was a case made for uh, a more expansionary package? As I've said, the decision was unanimous, and. Uh, that unanimity, uh, I think, carries a long way in demonstrating our resolve to deal with the issues. Now, as to markets, first of all, it takes a little bit of time generally for decisions to be analyzed, dissected, and, uh, and appreciated. The fact that we are dealing with this full allotment liquidity facility at reduced rate compared with current situation, uh, the fact that we are putting in place a massive targeted long-term refinancing system that is available to all with a particular focus on SMEs and uh, with multipliers that are uh, significant. If you look at the volume of lending that can be accessed, we're talking about 50% relative to previous uh, entitled loan book, if you will. Uh, we're talking about an entry rate of uh, minus 25 basis point, and we're talking about an ultimate interest rate based, based on the uh, track record of the lending institution of minus 75 basis points. I'm not sure that you can actually so much rival with that at the moment. Mr. Malin? And by the way, comparisons are odious. Jan Madin, Handelsblatt. Um, concerning, I have one question concerning bank lending. Um, the ECB can provide uh, cheap money, but the most important problem at the moment might be that that banks are more reluctant to to give pass on credit because of the risks. Um, is it necessary to have some form of national or maybe European guarantee schemes to, to um, ensure that? Um, and my second question, um, 
you've mentioned that there will probably be a lot of debt issuance in the future. Um, at the moment, certain countries are uh, hit especially hard, like Italy. Um, what can the ECB do if the spreads for government bonds increase? Would it be an option to, to activate, for example, the, the OMT program, or could there be other possibilities to help certain countries? Thank you. You know, on the, on the guarantee scheme, uh, I think I was very explicit in the introductory statement on that, but I'm happy to, to, to restate it. Um, we are making available to all enterprises with a focus on SMEs massive refinancing means, okay, at very preferential rates and in significant amounts. To encourage banks to actually use that facility, we believe, and we have put in the introductory statement, that guarantee schemes would very much be in order. So in other words, it's a guarantee that is put together by the state or an agency of the state or a European agency in order to support all a portion of the risk that is actually taken by the bank in extending lending facility to an enterprise, notably in a sector which is particularly exposed. I mean, that, that is how we, we, we believe that the financing we're putting in place will be most efficient. Okay? Now, whether that is conducted at the national level or at the European level is for the policymakers to decide. What matters to us is that it is in place as rapidly as is possible. Some countries have already taken steps or are exploring steps in that direction, and I would certainly, from, for, for the efforts that we are undertaking, I would certainly hope that they do that promptly in order to make sure that credit continues to flow to the economy, particularly the SMEs that are vulnerable in the present circumstances. So that was my point number one. My point number two has to do with um, more debt issuance coming down the road, depending on the fiscal um, expansion that will be determined by policymakers. Well, we, you know, we will be there, as I said earlier on, using full uh, flexibility, but we are not here to close spreads. This, this, is, this is not the function or the mission of the ECB. There are other tools for that, and there are other actors to actually deal with those issues. Uh, I'm now also going to go back to online. Uh, a question from Ms. Bufaki, Il Sole 24 Ore. Um, the first question is, again, on interest rates. We are living in extraordinary times, and Italy is adopting extraordinary measures to mitigate the impact of the coronavirus. Italy, and not only Italy, needs all the help it can get. Why did the governing council decide not to cut interest rates? What does it take to go lower than minus 0.5% on the deposit facilities on the line of the Teltro's new minus 0.75%? And the second question is on the envelope of additional APP, how strong will the PSPP contribution be in the envelope? And could the ECB consider or has the ECB discussed removing or changing the capital key APP requirements on a temporary basis? And then, Ms. Bufaki, I'm not going to go on because that's many more than two questions. <laughs> that's the beauty of being online. You can just carry on and on and on and on. <laughs> As I said, we, we really deliberated uh, long and hard all together to really assess what was the most efficient a uh, tool that we could use in order to target the risks that we have analyzed in the euro area. And we strongly believe that the uh, asset purchase program, temporary, large envelope, with no monthly predetermined allocation, which helps us actually focus on how the risks develop, that that is the most efficient tool that we can use under the present circumstances. And we shall use it. And the reason we are referring to the corporate, con corporate sector, the private sector contribution, is that it is currently a sector that is under uh, massive stress and causing uh, significant um, and excessive uh, sensitivities on, on markets and pose a risk to uh, stability. But flexibility will be used when we assess the risk and we measure where it is, 
uh, we will apply those, those flexibility. We have several programs in place. We have the CSPP, we have the PSPP, we also have the asset-based securities uh, purchase programs. We will deploy all the purchase programs that we have in order to focus on the risks as they are. And trust me, we will do that. Mr. Ziancantaris? Thank you. Uh, while significant the announcement uh, by the EU of a fund to tackle the, uh, the virus spread and its effects on the economy is about uh, 7.5 billion euros uh, immediately to grow 25, but this is to address the fallout of a pandemic in an economy of 17 trillion euros. Uh, and moreover, fiscal restriction reflexes are still uh, going strong, especially in the uh, European, uh, in the core countries. Uh, do you think that the fiscal authorities are rising up to the challenge? Are you happy with the divvying up of the, of the bill? And uh, my second question is, those famous three words were uttered uh, as a plea as, uh, from leaders recently, as a, as a promise for the European Central Bank moving forward in terms of policy, where are we going to see the uh, decisiveness? Is this uh, uh, the programs? Is this uh, uh, the, the basic is to add monetary stimulus to ease uh, credit frictions? Where will it uh, exhibit more, if I may? Thank you. Let me come back a little bit to um, the risk uh, channels as we see them. We, we are facing something that is different from uh, the great financial crisis, by the way, at this point in time. Uh, it's, we analyze it as a crisis that is fueled by um, a supply shock, followed by demand shock, and with great financial uncertainty. Okay, so those are the three sources that, that we identify. In the face of that, our analysis is that the response should be fiscal first and foremost. So I don't think that anybody should expect any central bank to be the line of first response. It's fiscal first and foremost, okay? So if you look at the fiscal measures that have been announced for the moment in the euro area, which we have done uh, yesterday, if you recap all that has been announced, not including uh, the European Commission, you arrive at a total of about 27 billion euros, which is more or less a quarter of 1% of GDP for the euro area. Okay. Hence, the reason why we are calling in our introductory statement for an ambitious and collective fiscal response. I believe that from the European Central Bank's viewpoint, we are expecting and anticipating that this response will be given, ambitious and collective. And we are doing our part using the tools that we have, which we believe will be best targeted to the risks that we see likely to develop in the near future, that is liquidity risk, that is an interruption or significant slowdown of the credit flow to the economy and the financial excessive sensitivities that we see at the moment, which create instability. And we are trying to address these three risks with the three tools that I have just mentioned. Unlimited and generous access to liquidity, number one. Considerably more attractive targeted long-term refinancing operation, particularly for these small and medium-sized enterprises, and a specific envelope of 120 billion euros for a special asset purchase program that will deploy and use all the flexibility embedded in the framework of the APP. I call it decisiveness, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Mr. Mendes Barrera. Uh, 
Victor Mendes Barreira, Central Bank and Publications. Uh, President Lagarde, my first question is in, in, is in relation to deflation risk. Already in February, we already saw um, inflation going down to 1.2%, and energy inflation declined by 0.3%, taking into account the developments in the oil price market. Uh, do you foresee that the current stimulus is sufficient to maintain to secure price stability going forward over the next few months? And my second question is in relation to the spreads you mentioned is not part of your, your mission to maintain the spreads narrower. But if it were to become a major problem for the Eurozone, as it was the case back in 2012, could you secure, could, you, could this crisis take precedent in your deliberations and could you deliver a, a sufficient package through APP? Thank you. Let, let me just backtrack a little bit and, and share with you um, the macroeconomic analysis that we have of the current situation. We regard the current um, shock as severe, but still temporary, if the right set of policy measures are decided by all players. Okay? What happens after a severe and temporary shock provided that the right measures have been taken by all the players, is that the economy will then bounce back. The exact timing of that is uncertain. As you know, for all of those of us that try, that try to do a bit of forecasting, we initially thought that the shock would be during the first quarter and the rebound will progressively start in the second. Clearly, everybody now is moving to the line of it's going to be a shock for the first two quarters and the rebound will be in the second half. Clearly, that schedule in and of itself and that timetable is shifting uh, gradually. So the best thing to say is that there will be a rebound. To time it precisely is uncertain. But we still very much hope that given that the right measures are taken by all the players, there will be a temporary nature associated with that, um, that very severe shock. If that is the case, our forecast for 21, very uh, slightly uh, reduced already, uh, will reflect the uh, bounce back of the economy, probably in the second half. 22 will also have a much better forecast. And the numbers will be published this afternoon in our um, macroeconomic provisions. So with that, Clearly, there is a shift that we're seeing in the economic cycle, but we still see inflation in 2022 at or about 1.6%, as will be published later on. We shall see, because clearly all these forecasts will have to be revisited on the basis of the policies that are taken by all the players in the next few weeks, I hope and not months, okay? So I hope that addresses your issue of the inflation movement as we forecast it. It will be lower than expected this year, it's obvious. Even, even if you take out uh, the oil shock, which, which will have an impact clearly, um, the trade-off between the positive and the negative uh, impact on inflation of the current development, whether it's a demand or a supply shock and the contribution of the demand versus supply to the current shock is, is going to be determined probably in a while, but we cannot tell exactly how that trade-off will, will take place. It's very likely that inflation will be lower than whatever we had forecasted this year. I would be dishonest if I was telling you something different, but what I'm trying to tell you is that we hope very much for a temporary nature of all these developments, followed by a bounce back that will take us back to a medium term that will be more in line with our forecast. Any more questions in the room? All, all right. we know for sure is that down risks are definitely tilted to the downside. That's for sure. Mr. Kutamanos. Uh, thank you. I've only one got. Uh, I've only got one question, um, uh, Ms. President. You have called upon uh, national governments and other authorities to launch more uh, urgent uh, fiscal action. Um, don't you think that uh, the ECB as bank supervisor has to act too? 
for example, by lowering, by, by lowering counter-cyclical buffers of capital or changing the tiering system on excess uh, reserves. Thank you. I don't mean to be... Um Rereading something that maybe you've read, but the, there was a press release that was just issued by the ECC Banking Supervision uh, Authority, and clearly, uh, as of now, because that was decided um, earlier in the day by the ECB, which has to approve those new measures, banks can fully avail of capital and liquidity buffers, including Pillar 2 guidance. Banks will benefit from relief in the composition of capital for Pillar 2 requirements, and ECB will consider operational flexibility in the implementation of supervisory measures depending on bank-specific circumstances. So I think in relation to buffers, that's a clear um, uh, use of all available buffers as they were designed for the current circumstances that we are facing. I'm now moving to a couple more questions that we have online. Uh, one is from Mr. Lacour from the AFP. Italian Finance Minister Gualtieri said Wednesday that the Italian plan of 25 billion euro should be supported by adequate measures from the European Central Bank. Does the ECB want to specifically support Italy and how? Would SMPs or even OMTs concepts be potentially considered? Well, Italy will be Italian banks, Italy, uh, Italian households, Italian enterprises will be fully beneficiaries and available, and sorry, eligible to all the uh, the tools that I have just mentioned. Whether it's the uh, the, the, the the massive liquidity uh, access at very reasonable and preferential rates compared with what we have now or whether it is the uh, targeted long-term refinancing at very um, attractive rates as well, or whether it's the use of the uh, special envelope of the asset purchase programs, all of that can also help Italy, f of course. And then I will uh, close, because many more questions are, the, are similar, with one from, uh, one from Mr. Taino, Corriere della Sera. The 120 billion euro could be used in a short time, question mark. And the second question, how worried are you from the possibility that a number of countries will increase significantly their public debt? i tell you what I'm particularly worried about. It would be the complacency and uh, slow motion process that would be demonstrated by the fiscal authorities of, of the euro area in particular. So I very much hope that at the Eurogroup uh, meeting that is taking place on Monday, and based on uh, recommendations and guidelines by the European Commission on Friday, there will be a, a, a decisive and uh, determined move in the direction of this ambitious and collective fiscal response that we have been calling for. Yep. By the way, unless the situation develops very rapidly for the better, it's unlikely that you will see the, both of us at the next press conference because we are moving into split teams, including at the executive board level. And our next governing council meeting on uh, April 1st, if I recall, uh, will actually be entirely um, online. Hmm? Of course there will be a briefing. But as you can see, you can dial in without it's working. And so we've also tested. There's also always an opportunity to, uh, to test new technology.